Nerd Soccer Tech Week podcast. I'm Greg Valoria, aka Social Greg, and you are? I am Adolfo Ferranda at Nerd Soccer. Cool. Cool. Uh, hey, Happy New Year, man. Happy New Year, man. Welcome back. It's uh, the 10th today, and uh, depending on where you're listening or watching, uh, it could be any other day. So, the magic of the internet. <laughs> magic. <laughs> well, what's this first one about why Apple is in no hurry to sell its iPhone lawsuits? Right, right, right. So, this one is comes from uh, CNN Money from a cat mm-hmm. named uh, Philip Elmer DeWitt. Um, yeah, so he what he does is he works for Deutsche Bank, right? Uh, this guy named Chris Whitmore, who wrote a, a, liter- a okay. letter to his clients uh, on Monday that lists uh, four possible scenarios for um, outcomes to the patent wars being fought in courts right now uh, around the world between Apple and uh, Google, right, uh, in mm. terms of the Android ecosystem, you know, in relation to that. So number one, he says it's uh, to settle with uh, per unit license fee paid to Apple you know, which would be in Apple's interest, right? Number two would be a sure. more favorable outcome where Apple handicaps uh, Android feature set and or distribution and captures 25% of Android's future market share is the projection. No kidding. Or three, wow. there's, it's a neutral kind of a stalemate with no winner. And uh, four, <laughs> Apple loses and must pay the counterclaim. Now, the thing is, you can tell in this letter that he's banking on number one and two actually happening uh, as he further sort of... Uh, progresses and and notes to his clients in this in this note saying you know in outcome number one he's saying a settlement where apple licenses its intellectual property for about 10 bucks per android device sold uh could add uh according to whitmore's calculations roughly 35 dollars to apple's share price i mean this is massive you know payout i mean this is like we're getting in microsoft oh territory right here we'll uh, just wait till android becomes really freaking uh popular yeah yeah exactly so you wonder why manufacturers are running away from android to to some extent or hedging oh actually gosh. i should say so outcome yes. number two is now where android's feature set or ability to, to distribute is diminished considerably less hmm. likely, but the payoff could be enormous. If Apple were to capture 25% of uh, future anticipated Android market, for example, Whitmore estimates that Apple's share price could grow uh, by roughly $260 per share. Um, as a result, he concludes uh, they suspect Apple's unlikely to sell, settle cheaply, right? Uh, Apple investors, meanwhile, should sit tight is what he's saying. According to Whitmore, they're gaining exposure to a potentially very lucrative, favorable IP outcome for little or no cost. So uh, oh you know, it looks like a win-win for Apple, uh, according to, to this Deutsche um, you know, analyst here. Really interesting. So speaking of think, Apple, Greg, what, what yes. you got? You're asking uh, Apple asked Chinese companies to cease production plans for Steve Jobs figuring claim. Oh, this was this is hilarious. I saw the tweet from Nine to Five Mac. I followed them, and, and it was from the, uh, the the Telegraph, which is a UK based um, you know, media source, right? And uh, they said that the, basically uh, Apple is asking to cease production of these 12 inch figurines. And, and, you know, as I did the backstories for all of this thing, then research it was just hilarious going through this. So they said the 12 inch figurine, which comes complete with Jobs' trademark blue jeans, sneakers, and black turtleneck sweater, was created by a Chinese company called In Icons and was set for release in February. But their efforts have reportedly met with a legal challenge from Apple's. Uh, uh, and Apple's legal counsel allegedly threatening to sue the toy maker unless they cease trading. And in another interview from ABC News, um, you know, the in icons Tandy Chiang, uh, he he loves actually uh, Steve Jobs. I mean, I guess he loves him enough to make some money, but but anyway, <laughs> it loves him that much. Um, he, he said that the company will not stop production in lieu of Apple's request, saying the technology company cannot copyright Jobs' appearance. Wow. Apple can do it. So he quotes him: "Apple can do anything they like. I will not stop. We already started production." Steve Jobs is not an actor. He's just a celebrity. Mm. Mm, that's interesting. I thought that was an interesting mm. comment. There's no copyright protection for a normal person. Steve Jobs is not a product, so I don't think Apple has the copyright of him. Wow. So, and I, I thought, you know, and this, I mean, I think everyone heard it. I just like to talk about it on this podcast because mm-hmm. it's just, it's just kind of amazing is that, you know how much protection that Apple is giving uh, Steve Jobs, even yeah. when he was alive. There right, was right. there was issues about that as well. But we see a um, slew of these like Steve Jobs books coming out now. You know. Oh, oh, oh uh, today in uh, VentureBeat, um, Ma- Ma- Megan Kelly mm-hmm. actually um, wrote about the the comic book for Steve Jobs. Oh, where wow. It actually goes through That's his right. whole history. 
Uh, but actually, what I thought the funny part of that story was is that it didn't include his death because it actually the comic book went into production prior to his oh, death. My gosh. And I thought that was kind of weird because like, wow, I mean, what, what are they doing using a Gutenberg press or something? Right, right. I mean, you know, a manual Gutenberg press or something? Yeah. Well, let me lead you into the next one. Uh, Samsung versus Google. That was kind of interesting. I, I, I read up on that. And, you know, cut. T- tell, the, tell the listeners about yeah, that one. good stuff. So this one comes from a Monday Note blog is what it's called by Jean-Louis Gasset. It's a very interesting sort of thought piece here and a really mm-hmm. neat sort of perception on the way things are going right now. So, uh, you know, what, what Jean-Louis is saying is that as we enter into 2012, um, it seems the game may be changing, right? So looking at last week's numbers uh, for Motorola, when this post was, was made anyways, according to the state, uh, numbers for Motorola and HTC and Samsung, uh, we see a very different type of picture. Instead of the old, mm-hmm. there's more, you know, quote, there, there's more than enough room for every Android handset maker to be a winner, uh, unquote. Uh, we have had a three-horse race uh, with a definitive leader, and that leader True. being Samsung now, uh, while Motorola and, H- Motorola and HTC lag behind. So that brings up the question, you know, leaves us with the potential for an interesting face-off, not Samsung versus Motorola HTC, but Samsung versus Google, right? Uh, as Eric Sherman wow. observes in his CBS Money, Money Watch post, uh, since Samsung ships close to 55% of all Android phones, um, you know, they got a big leg up here, and uh, the company could be in a position to twist uh, Google's arm if last quarter's trend continue. If Motorola and HTC lose even more ground, Samsung's bargaining position will become even stronger. But what's Samsung's bargaining position? Yeah, exactly. What could they want? Perhaps more search referral money is what he's asking, uh, dollars flowing through Whoa. Google search engines used on the smartphone, right? Earlier access to Android releases, possibly, and uh, maybe even a share of uh, revenue, uh, the advertising revenue, which which is wow. Google's bread and butter, right? So will Google let Samsung gain the upper hand is the question here. Not likely is what he says, or at least not for, mm. for the long term. There's um, The thing is that there's Motorola, which is about to come wow. become a fully owned, but quote, independent Google subsidiary, right? Uh, a Google-rola vertically integrated smartphone line could counterbalance Samsung's influence uh, in theory. Um, mm. And so it would mm. be Samsung's move uh, and they would be defenseless supposedly right right? but but you also have to consider the kindle fire example just like amazon picked uh the android lock samsung could grab the android open source code and create its own unlicensed but fully legal smartphone operating system and still benefit from a portion uh, of android applications or it could build its own app store the way amazon did samsung uh he says is already showing related inclinations with its music hub and its iMessage competitor so, Greg, what's this next story you got here? Uh, fake Siri arrives on the Android market. Oh, yeah. Right right at the end of the year, it was kind of hilarious. I was watching my tweets. Uh, then uh, Uber Gizmo kind of caught my eye. Um, uh, so, basically, uh, Uber Gizmo, uh, really good, um, some articles out of there by George Wong. Uh, he reported that, you know, one of the problems with the Android market uh, is the lack of app moderation, as we talked about before in other podcasts. Mm-hmm. Um, tons of fake apps are loaded on a daily basis, right, yeah. and usually pulled only when the apps are found to be malicious or infringing on copyrights. But it usually takes a while for, you know, Google to catch all that. But sure. one of the latest apps to join this uh, b- uh, fake app parade comes from a developer called Official App, which is no doubt designed to fool inexperienced <laughs> Android users, right? So the developer recently wow. put an app up uh, you know, during that time uh, that had the real Siri logo on the Android market and fooling people it was a real thing. And the hilarious part about it, 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 it wasn't even a Siri clone. I mean, basically it launches Google Voice. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Oh gosh! <laughs> it was just hilarious. So that you know that happened on the 30th, or actually I think it launched on the 28th, and mm. then by the 30th, Google you know I probably heard all these stories and removed it. And so uh, I saw the next tweet uh, by ne- the next web, which has really good content as well. Yeah. Uh, they said you know the that was actually pulled on the 30th, and um, they were a lot more rapid to act. But you know. Mm. It, it, the issue really is, is that you know these these apps come onto the store. They're not moderated like uh, the you know the iTunes store, right. and 
they just appear and basically they're always playing catch up, right? Yeah, I think that's yeah. the issue with it. And anyway, what, what you know, I saw this tweet this uh, this this week. Uh, Ubuntu TV and Opera making its debut at CES. Yeah, so speaking I, which of CES, basically a lot shorter than I thought it would be. <laughs> yeah, the release. Yeah. yeah, so this this little blurb comes from uh, Engadget and Terrence O'Brien mm. uh, of Terrence o Terrence O'Brien of Engadget. Uh, he mentions that Canonical's Mark Shuttleworth promised back a while ago that Ubuntu would come to televisions eventually. Uh, mm. But we never expected it to arrive so quickly, is what he said. Uh, a concept mm. preview is here at CES for convention goers to get their, their eyes on, and they'll be uh, swinging through the company's booth to get some uh, hands-on. You can see a video of it, which we'll post on NerdStalker also. Take a look at it. It's very mm. interesting. Uh, for now, it's largely a tech demo and concept, but there are already some neat features on display, like a 3D dash, searchable guide, and streaming video applications. Uh, the cool. goal, the company says, is to, quote, uncomplicate television by removing as much as the paraphernalia that accompanies it, primarily the boxes and cables, right? So a lot of these other types of solutions uh, require some sort of like dongle or an actual box itself. You know, we think of Boxy or the Roku box or something like that. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. These guys are strictly you know, going to be embedded in the television. They're going to be open source. They're going to be free to use, nice. right? For the uh, wow. for the OEMs, I'm I'm uh, assuming here since it's open source, yeah. right, or whatever. Um, and not only that, I think Opera is doing something similar, but uh, in a browser, mm -hmm. uh, all HTML5. So um, these are all platforms right now, and uh, I think we're going to see a ton of these things popping up. Uh, it has that same sort of experience as something like I said, like a Boxy uh, application. If you've ever installed I Boxy see. Local I or see. XBMC or something like that, you see your typical yeah. sort of like you know, um, lean back sort of experience and, and that kind of thing. So it's it's an interesting proposition. Uh, we'll post a video. Really cool stuff. Mm. So now this has to get embedded into a, a a TV that has the capability of embedding this type of uh, application. Or? Yeah, since this um, since this is Ubuntu, right? It's a uh, they will have to in in I believe install something. It's Ubuntu is a Linux you know operating system, and this ah, is a right, Linux. Right, I would right. imagine it's a Linux flavor of uh, this yeah. type of solution probably running yeah. on the operating system. So this operating system, I would assume, need to be installed or or somehow embedded in a tiny, you know, some embedded operating, operating system type way yeah. into a television. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. So, hey, man, oh, nice. what, what is about, speaking of televisions, what is this rumor that, that we're hearing here? Well, I, you know, um, I think everyone's been talking about what what's a threat to Netflix, right? They they, they had some gaffes last year, you know, and people start really kind of talking about them. Maybe maybe it was good PR for Netflix, but mm -hmm. it usually was bad PR. You know, they 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 did a lot of interesting things last year, but um, you know, everyone's been touting um, as Amazon being the threat to Netflix because of content, right? Well, mm -hmm. uh, this story from uh, Media Post, uh, Media Post blogs by Daisy uh, Whitney, mm -hmm. uh, the title is "Rumored Apple TV Could Be a Real Threat to Netflix." So, uh, you know, she goes on. She goes on to suggest that, uh, making some compelling argument that, you know, uh, you know, a Apple has already done. A f fantastic job convincing consumers they must have products they never needed before. So to be sure, Apple TV didn't quite take off as hoped, but that's a set-top box. If this ITV comes to fruition, which, you know, all the rumors say it's a 32, 37-inch um, with embedded, <laughs> a, you know, Apple operating system, as we just talked about before with um, Ubuntu, right. um, it could be the next iteration of what Apple has done well, make new screens for new experiences. So, you know, what they're saying is that, you know, possibly uh, the key would be turning whatever TV Apple makes into a development platform for content providers, which makes a heck of a lot of sense. Uh -huh. Let other people develop apps for ITV and just provide the platform for it, just like they did with iPhone and, and the the iPad. So, um we're on the Apple kick in this uh, yeah. entry uh, Apple Nerd Stalker streak. podcast for 2012. Right, right. Um, and uh, it looks like Target's getting into the Apple Act, uh, my friend, right? Yeah, yeah. So as we know now, Apple currently has a sort of partnership with Best Buy, right? And that has to do with like uh, mm -hmm. their old partnership, their early partnerships with uh, Sears, mm -hmm. Circuit City, uh, Computer City, and uh, Office Max, which are all sort of dead, right? Deadpool kind of, or right. terminated relationships. They went with Best Buy. Best Buy uh, doesn't have the biggest of stores, I believe it's somewhere in the range of 600 stores, right? And they have these mini yeah, sort of yeah. uh, Apple experiences where Best Buy actually sells Apple computers and things like that, which is pretty unheard of. You know, they're very mm -hmm. uh, control, you know, oriented in that regard. 
they mm. uh, have a pre-existing um, relationship with Target and where they've let Target sell the iPod actually for some I time see. now. And then they eventually let them, I believe they're selling iPads too. But what they've never done is allowed them to sell computers, right? Um, mm. The only other sort of um, third party vendor or whatever was that that could do that in-store retailer and was Best Buy, right? So yeah. now uh, what they're doing is they're trying to trying out something in uh, with 25 larger Target stores in, in various locations, uh, which uh, can't support a local, you know, standalone a Apple store. So what oh, they're I saying see. here is uh, this is Daniel Aaron Dilger of Apple Insider is he's saying mm. the initial opening will be a small start given that Target, the second largest discount retail chain in the U.S. operates. 1,752 stores in the U.S. Apple has wow. opened 359 of its own retail stores globally, 245 of which are in the U.S. So it says okay. uh, it's going to okay. allow them to open, um, you know, a store within a store type of thing. So we shall see. You know, right. if this thing works out, uh, we could see a, a quite a huge spread of uh, more opportunities for Apple to sell more things. It's it's weird when you think about it because you think Apple has like they're doing massive sales already, but then but then right. you hear things like. Oh, they're just about to sell the iPhone, you know, the new iPhone 4S, whatever, in China, for instance, right? And you're like, whoa, right, they right. haven't they haven't scaled that far out. So the growth potential is huge, right, for this, and with domestically too. Wow. I mean, if they could get to those areas wow. where they don't have Apple stores and there's these pre-existing sort of Target locations, um, right? You know, the sky's the limit. Speaking right. of uh, reach, reaching for employees, how can I get a job at Facebook or Quora? Greg? Oh, oh, this is cool. So last week, I thought this was really cool. Um, basically, it's um, marketing PR meets recruiting. So um, last week, uh, Tech Cocktail, uh, Kira Newman, uh, tweeted out, uh, you know, two-day coding contest to win interviews at Facebook, Quora, and more. You know, and of course, mm. I'm going to click that thing because I want to find out what the more is. So it turns out that um, a 48-hour coding competition called Code Sprint uh, kicked off last week. Open to everyone. Uh, the competition asks you to solve programming problems to win interviews at more than 65 companies, including Facebook, Quora, Amazon, Skype, Dropbox, Groupon, and Airbnb. Wow. Um, and then uh, basically when the tweet went out on Wednesday, which was, I believe, the 5th, um, uh, the the participants could browse the available companies and and choose which to apply to. I mean, it's pretty cool. And additional to theoretical problems, the the, the competition also focused on real world problems that interviewing companies have solved. Um, as and as for the languages, you're looking at C, C plus plus, C sharp, Java, Python, Perl, PHP, Ruby. I mean, all yeah, of them. Scala, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> I mean. I mean, but I thought, again, what the marvelous move was by um, uh, a recruiter called Interview Street was really to mix this kind of contest gaming PR mm, thing mm. with interviews. And, you know, in this valley right now, or SF Tech, it's it's hard to find developers. Yeah, I, I yeah mean, it's super competitive. It, yeah. it is really hard to find developers. Right. So I think it was a great move from a marketing PR standpoint mm -hmm. to, to really go – kind of you know on the edge and and create a contest to get you know um great applicants right they're pre-qualified clever if, if yeah. you can solve the problem right yeah it has a very um, sort of guerrilla marketing type of feel to it yeah way to go yeah yeah i liked it uh that was that caught my eye so mm -hmm. i think i had to bring this up on the podcast so cool <laughs> So, so yeah, okay. Um, the next thought piece I think uh, you had tweeted out uh, this last week uh, is basically uh, a, a a thought piece about the Windows Phone and uh, who's buying it and is it really going to succeed? Right? Yeah, yeah. So this one comes from the New York Times from a writer named Nick Winfield. Uh, he asked, you know, about the Windows Phone. He's saying um, it, it's really neat. Sort of, it gives a history of of you know, sort of Windows Phone and why they're sort of at, uh, well, sort of a theory mm. of why they're at where they are right now, you know? And um, okay. so so he said essentially they were getting, uh, several years ago, they were getting killed uh, by RIM and Apple uh, when they had the, what it was, Windows Mobile, right? And it looked essentially like mm. Windows on a phone. It looked really horrible. In fact, it even had a little start menu at the time uh, on the phone and it was just getting decimated, right? So they had this meeting at Microsoft right. um, and this meeting, I think they called it Cage Match or something like that, where they got the Windows uh, <laughs> like mobile it. team together and they said, look, what can we do to fight off these guys? You know, um, mm. is, can we can we iterate on this existing sort of, you know, this code base or can we, you know, save some of it or 
you know, God yeah. forbid, do we scrap everything and start from scratch? Well, uh, they came to the conclusion wow. that it's, you know, that they need to scrap everything, that they really could not compete unless they scrap everything and start from mm-hmm. scratch, that it was completely unusable. Interesting. And what this did is this set them two years behind. Not only that, um, Android was just about coming on, and what it did, it gave Google the opportunity to partner with a lot of uh, established partnerships uh, with all these OEMs, right, these third-party vendors and stuff, and these other manufacturers, which traditionally had went to Microsoft, right, always. Yeah, Microsoft owned OEMs, basically, right, and every, it was mm, assumed, you know, mm, look at look yeah, at Windows, yeah, period, absolutely. right? Um, so, so what this did also was, uh, actually, next Microsoft, he said he compared this um, sacrifice uh, to the movie where the guy gets his arm stuck in the boulders, right? Um, for But oh, getting yeah. your arm stuck in a boulder for two years, in between the boulders for two years, right? Before you, you know, <laughs> chew it off years. or cut it off, right? Uh, oh, my god! So And also, he, you know, this, this author says, uh, the writer says, unlike Apple, Microsoft didn't make their own hardware, and they uh, paid for mm-hmm. it initially. But now uh, Microsoft has uh, put requirements to manufacturers because before they didn't. So the initial rollout of Windows Phone and all the rave reviews of the beautiful design were all great and fine and dandy. But then their, their first phones to roll out didn't have any requirements requirements to these uh, third-party manufacturers. So they performed kind of weird. Um, they were sort of cheap and crappy and plasticky, you know, a lot of them. Wow. And so in the next rev, they said, look, you guys have to have X amount of processor, X amount of RAM, and these put these uh, requirements on the on the manufacturer. Some of them said, you know, whatever, some, you know, don't need the, to prioritize this and say uh, Android lets them do whatever they want and they're coming on super strong and their sales are right. kicking butt. Uh, so there was no real incentive. And, you know, and, and Apple, they own the whole vertical, right? So they're they're sitting pretty, right? Uh, so this yeah, puts Microsoft yeah. in a really weird, awkward position, right? So they rev the, pho- mm. the phone, Windows phone. It got better, you know, with all these this quicker updates mm. and then, you know, um, getting mm. a better relationship and then Nokia partnership, you know, Uh but uh, they're again, they're two years behind of everything. So, ex, um, what they say here, uh, they needed, they need. The conclusion here is that they need a blockbuster this year, right? Um, or they're going to be, yeah. they're essentially going to be do- dead agree. in the mobile um, operating system space. So, a very fascinating sort of behind the scenes story uh, about well, what's happening with these guys. Yeah. I mean, you know, when you went to the conference, uh, I, I was kind of excited because I saw uh, some of the things that you were tweeting out. And, mm-hmm. you know, I went and saw some of the marketing PR pieces on, you know, their their future vision mm-hmm. of the operating system on mobile devices mm-hmm. uh, as well as desktop devices, you know, kind of an interconnectivity, yeah. you would say. Yeah. And it was it was really cool, kind of like this 3D thing going down and, you know, almost like holographic effects uh, eventually. Um you know where you could use that to collaborate and and really you know you know rock rock the uh, Windows world with with uh, you know these these icon icon like like structures and right. you, you had told me that you really liked the interface yeah I really for, loved Windows for, Phone uh, they you know. it put the company Microsoft in such a desperate position that they had to do something different um, right and something innovative which they really did I know the initial designers. Uh, who are some most of which are are no longer with Microsoft um, got inspiration from like Euro- European and uh, subway signs that are very sort of stark typography right very clear and concise right um, right and right. bomber uh, there was a story of bomber initially seeing it for the first time and noticing that uh, I think it was the month something like January or something was was uh, kind of going off the screen and and he made them sort of like change that kind of thing he had these little things but he just sort of begrudgingly sort of take took it right and and then and then yeah. we saw they saw success with that and what's interesting is there's this guy joe bellafiore who's been with microsoft for a very long time and he's mm. sort of the engineering sort of side but he's sort of taken the lead on this whole thing in fact um he was on the the you know the defunct zune team as well which had a very similar look to windows phone right which is a beautiful interface yeah. it just was way too late and all this also right so they suffer from this pattern but uh, what they did is they let him also put this sort of design upon Windows 8. So you're seeing this really, these um, big risks, right, that, that Microsoft taking yeah. is taking, uh, which is very interesting. My concern is that now they're focusing so much on hardware and that and performance kind of yeah. stuff that I wonder if they're going to keep innovating with design. We saw the death of the Mix conference uh, is what people are yeah. saying because they haven't said anything about it. And then we see Build, which is much more sort of like a development-centric sort of gigantic conference. Uh, about like yeah. you need to develop for Windows 8, all you engineers, and we're back to this again, right? So uh, I don't know if they're learning from their from their past mistakes or not. Here, all right, it's tip time. Tip time, tip time, tip time. So this is Social Greg's tip. 
as my tip, I think you should uh, look at the um, Roku streaming stick, which makes a regular TV, well, you know, digital TV, into a smart TV. And um, this was by uh, Real SEO, uh, which really does a lot of content on video. You should check them out. Um, so it, it's cool. It plugs into um, a non-smart TV. So, you know, we were talking about embedded operating systems earlier. Well, TVs don't have to do it, but it has to be a digital TV, uh, into the TV's HDMI port. And then basically it has wireless um, you know, connectivity in it. So basically you could, you know, it'll be used just like a Roku. Um, so, and, and you don't have any wires. Awesome. How's that? Yeah. Isn't very that cool? cool. Yeah. Yeah. So do the magic of science. Very slick, and, man. Yeah. So, yeah, I you know Roku content, remember, has Netflix and Hulu. So a lot of content out there for you guys. Awesome. So, uh, and fifty bucks, uh, fifty bucks versus fifteen hundred, yeah. maybe for uh, yeah. ITV yeah. is the target, right? So Interesting. good alternative. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think we can. We need to throw away TVs like this behind me no, no, yeah. anytime soon. Yeah, so <laughs> my tip is actually an Android app. It's called a uh, Boycott Sopa. Uh, so as you know, mm. SOPA is the Stop Online Privacy Act, which is a complete joke and farce, and everyone should call their legislators and their representatives and tell them that they are against it. Uh, but what, what this Android app is, is um, it's a free Android application you can use to scan barcodes to help identify if the product mm. are either created by or intimately re related to SOPA supporting companies. There are currently over 800 right. brands and companies in their list. Uh, the list curr is currently being used by the application is available on their website. Uh, the application will help you identify goods of companies which, according to publicly available sources, appear to have been supporting SOPA as of approximately January 5th, uh, but they're re revving that all the time. Uh, it's intended as an aid to identify such uh, products that shouldn't that should not be relied upon. You should carry out, carry out your own check is what they're saying here in case, you know, any product this app indicates uh, is a product of a company is supporting SOPA is not. Uh, so visit their URL at uh, their website at nomoresopa.com for more in information and download it for your Android phone. Nice. What, what I'll announce here is that we are actually been chosen to be a media partner for the uh, Node Summit. So uh, let me tell you a little Yay. bit about the Node Summit. The Node Summit is a two-day conference at the Mission Bay Conference Center in San Francisco, uh, January 4th mm. to January 25th of this year. Uh, please check them Love out. It's place. at uh, nodesummit.com for more information. There's going to be a lot of amazing, amazing speakers there. The creator of Node himself is going to be there. Um, startups, engineers, uh, you know, uh, Everyone should check this thing out. It's an up-and-coming uh, technology that is that is here, and it's uh, coming on very strong. Especially if you're into HTML5 or anything like that, mm -hmm. you really should check it out. It's gonna it's gonna change things quite a bit, and this this is gonna be a very interesting uh, conference to start off this whole movement here. Can I go? Can I go? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We will be there. <laughs> <laughs> please, please. So, what else is going on, man, <laughs> with our cool. old buddies at SF New Tech? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, I met with Miles this week. We planned out 2012. There's going to be some pretty exciting mm -hmm. shows coming up. But uh, the, the first one of 2012 will be uh, uh, Meet and See, uh, Tetris, uh, IQ Engines, uh, Cappy, uh, Heard About, and RAVN. I, like, okay, thanks for letting me do yeah. this because I can hardly pronounce these things, and I thought anything. they were like bands. I just wanted to hear so. him say Cappy. <laughs> Cappy. <laughs> <laughs> Cappy. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I sound so... So good about yeah, that. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. but um, yeah, and uh, you know, doors open at 5:30 uh, at 119 Utah Street, uh, San Francisco, at the Mighty. Uh, you the know, usual club, free so. tacos and amazing technology and startups. And the, and I'll be doing the UStream as usual for 2012. Uh, our company, Vtrax, uh, will do the UStream, and uh, I'll do the uh, pre-show with some interviews. Uh, I'll introduce some of the people we're presenting. And uh, you know, and we'll just have some fun with it. So it'll be it'll be really cool. Yeah. So, so people, don't forget yeah. to please contribute to our to the show. You know, you can uh, contribute our stories that we will talk about uh, your stories as well. To uh, use the hashtag on Twitter nrdstk. Also, check us out at nerdstalker.com and on iTunes. You can subscribe to our audio or video podcast and give us a rating. That always helps out too. And look us up on YouTube. Do a search for Nerd Stalker TV, all one word, Nerd Stalker TV on YouTube. And yep. um, yeah, so Greg, how do we get a hold of you? Hey, oh, uh, you can get a hold of me on Twitter, uh, Greg Gloria uh, at Social Greg. 
right there. Okay. And uh, you can reach me on, on email at uh, socialgregsf at gmail.com. And you, Adolfo? Cool. You can email me at adolfo at nerdstalker.com. And you can find me at Twitter at nerdstalker. So uh, thanks for joining us, everyone. Nice. You're very cool. Yeah. It's Be careful fun. out there. I pay you top dollar for this crap. This insubordination. <laughs> well, you know, I'm, I'm a rebel. <laughs> <laughs> You're a ruble, a Russian ruble. All I'm right. a ruble, real Russian ruble. Russian ruble, Russian currency. Rebel.